All right, so we have this conundrum here. We have a spectrum of light that is not continuous. That's the term for a rainbow spectrum. We see all the colors. It's not a continuous spectrum. It's just got these little parts of the rainbow, these very specific wavelengths. They were over here, I erased them. But I left the picture up because I want you to remember what the problem is. And also this kind of partial solution. Not really a physics solution, more of a just a little mathematical description of these wavelengths. Remember the, the red color goes n equals three. These are the n numbers here. And then the bluish one is four, and then the two deep purple ones are five and six. You plug those numbers in here, you get the right wavelength out, but why? Well, Niels Bohr figured out why, partially. Uh, and we're going to talk about what he figured out, because it's super awesome. Now, he figured that this was all happening. By this point in time, we knew that uh, an atom had a positive nucleus surrounded by electrons. Okay, Knew nothing else about it, really, other than there was a heavy, solid nucleus of protons in the middle, and later on we found out neutrons in the middle. And then uh, surrounding that was a swarm of electrons. You know, that's sort of the picture we have now. The simplest picture you have in your mind of what an atom is with the positive nucleus and the negative cloud of electrons around it. Bohr figured that whatever this was, was originating in atoms. And if we could understand atoms better, then maybe we could understand this. This problem led us to a revolutionary new picture of the atom painted in more detail than had ever been done before. And this was the Bohr model of the atom, B-O-H-R. Okay. Niels Bohr was the fellow who uh, cracked this one. He came into his work with three assumptions. And it wasn't this simple. There were so many blind alleys, so many mistakes, so many errors, so many uh, just wrong, so much wrong thinking. I just make it sound very simple when I say, oh, there's three assumptions. We had to figure out the assumptions. And some of them had to kind of reverse engineer them. It was a, 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 quite, a, quite a problem. But from our point of view, looking at it, you know, 100 years later, three assumptions. Okay, the first one can be summarized in a picture. I'm not going to write words other than to say uh, I'm going to draw a picture. I, I'm going to draw a picture. So the assumption was that the, the atom looked something like this. There was a positive nucleus. And remember, this is a hydrogen atom. Three assumptions about hydrogen atom, the simplest of all atoms. This is all hydrogen. This spectrum is hydrogen. So the first assumption was that there's a proton in the middle, a positive nucleus, and the electron, he assumed, goes in a circular orbit around it. Okay, which of course is not true. Okay, but it was fruitful in this case, as we'll see. So he figured there was a proton in the middle with an electron that goes around it. And uh, the radius of the atom, believe it or not, he called R. The distance from the proton to the electron is R, All right? The, the radius of the circle. He also assumed that the electron was attracted to the proton by the electric force, which we have seen. The Coulomb force, right? You have two charges. You have two charges separated by a distance r. Right? The charge of the proton is plus e. 
the electron charge minus E, where E, do I have room? Do I have room? I think I do. Where E is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, as we know from the first half of class when we all sat in the same room with each other before all this happened. So, those are the charges. The distances are. So his first assumption was that there's a circular orbit here, right? And, uh, you know, the thing moves around with, with speed v. That's the velocity vector. Always, right, the velocity vector is always tangent to the circle as it goes around. Okay. And that the force between them is Ke, our old friend, times E squared over R squared. That's the Coulomb force law. Remember, this is just the magnitude. Don't worry about the signs of the charges. One's E, one's minus E. Take the absolute value of their product, you get E squared on top. Divided by R squared, the distance between them on the bottom. So he used the Coulomb force. He knows the two are attracted to each other. Unlike charges attract. Like charges repel. Unlike charges attract. So he knew they were attracting with that force. He also knew the motion was circular. So this was centripetal acceleration. We've seen centripetal acceleration when we saw the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field goes in the field and makes a circular motion. We talked about centripetal acceleration. So this equals m times a sub c, right? F equals m a. It doesn't go away even when you're Niels Bohr doing quantum physics. Okay, F still equals m a. Okay, but centripetal acceleration is v squared over r as we saw Earlier in the class, earlier in the semester, we talked about the motion of that particle in the electric in the magnetic field. So we can write Ke times e squared over r squared equals m v squared over r. Right, because a sub c is v squared over r. And of course, we can cancel one of those r's. We have one over r squared on the left-hand side. Okay. So we can cancel that. But this is the first assumption. Okay. Pigeonhole that. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to leave it on the board. But you got to remember that as we go forward. This is an extended argument. I want you to listen and learn. And to learn, I want you to keep that in mind right there. I'll rewrite it on the board in a few minutes, but next, next video, it won't be there.